Dead Space is a survival horror game series with a strong emphasis on space engineering. Unlike numerous other popular sci-fi games, you're not playing as a highly trained soldier who knows exactly what to do in every situation and has a lot of luck. Instead, you're an engineer who's supposed to fix a communications problem on a spaceship, who ends up needing to engineer his way out of a terrible situation. Ever since I was probably too young to play the original 2008 version of the game, the space setting and engineering focus of Dead Space was intriguing to me. After finishing several college degrees in engineering and space studies, I thought it would be interesting to see just how accurate the space engineering elements of the game actually are, or if it's all just techno babble and miraculous black boxes. So I decided to review the game in the most engineer-esque way possible, in extreme detail. To this end, we'll go through the game chronologically, one chapter at a time, to identify errors and accuracies in the game's portrayal of space and engineering, while avoiding spoilers as much as possible. While avoiding spoilers to this video, I can say that I definitely recommend the game to anyone interested in space engineering, as long as you don't mind the more hardcore elements. That is to say, a lot of people, as well as YouTube, aren't really the biggest fans of blood and gore or extreme violence, which is basically all of the actual gameplay of Dead Space. For this video though, I've cut out as much of that stuff as possible, but whatever little is left is included for educational purposes. I also want to point out up front that I won't be reviewing the tools or suits of Dead Space, considering that either of those topics would be long enough for their own reviews. Before we get started though, if we're going to be analyzing sci-fi technology for realism, it's probably worth defining what that actually means in the context of a futuristic setting. In his book, The Physics of Superheroes, Dr. James Kakalios investigates how comic book superheroes stand up against the laws of physics. In this book, he uses a rule of miracle exceptions to determine which superheroes can be considered realistic. In other words, every superhero is allowed one miracle exception to the laws of physics for them to still be considered realistic. Applying the same rule to Dead Space, we'll consider the miracle exception of the series to be the unified field theory. Without going into excessive detail, a unified field theory is a means of uniting the fundamental forces of the universe into a single cohesive equation. In current quantum theories, the electromagnetic force and the strong and weak nuclear forces are all interrelated, but gravity is not. So a unified field theory would explain how these three fundamental forces interact with gravity. In the Dead Space universe, this theory has been discovered, and through its application, allows the manipulation of gravity similarly to how electromagnetic manipulation is commonplace today. Thus, for the purposes of our space and engineering review here, we'll consider the technological ramifications of the unified field theory to be allowable under this miracle exception rule. So with all that being said, now that we have our boundary conditions defined and the stated objective of this review in mind, let's get started with the review. Right off the bat, let's start with the faster than light propulsion system used in the Dead Space universe, that being the shock point drive. While not specifically explained in the series, the shock point drive is theorized to be similar in functionality to an Elcubierre warp drive. This method of faster than light propulsion shows up occasionally in other science fiction settings, and is often considered one of the more plausible means of achieving superluminal propulsion considering that it doesn't necessarily violate any physical laws, or at least does so less than other approaches. Basically, the way this system works is that space-time itself is pulled from the front of the ship and pushed behind the ship. The end result of this is that this bubble of space-time is being propelled forward through the surrounding space-time at superluminal velocities. But the space-time inside the bubble is not itself moving faster than the speed of light. If we can assume that some of the more complex astrophysical problems with this technology have been resolved through the use of the unified field theory, then I don't think it's necessary for the shock point drive to require its own miracle exception, and so we're still within our one exception allowance. Taking a look at the bridge of the Kellyanne, we see a recurring theme, which is an excessive amount of protruding objects that could easily pinch a hand or give you a nasty cut if you were to be so unfortunate as to fall into them, such as the sh if the ship were to make a sharp turn, or if the gravity suddenly failed. Contrary to that, though, we also see a fair amount of handles that could be used to stabilize yourself in the event of gravity failure or for moving around in zero gravity and as a way to secure yourself in the event of a collision or a rough landing. Once again, utilizing the unified field theory and gravity manipulation, the Kellyanne approaches the USG Ishimura by way of an automated docking system utilizing gravity tethers, which makes sense for precision flight operations in space to be able to have computer control, making sure that there's less room for operator error, 
But in the event of a failure of such a system, as can be seen here, then there ought to be a manual override so that an operator can take control and guide the craft in safely. Blast shields are always a good thing on space windows like this. However, unless the windows are constructed of a very strong material, this poses a, a structural weak point in the design of the ship. And in the event of a micrometeoroid impact or other space debris impacting this part of the ship, a hull breach can occur more easily in this area, which is an obvious hazard. Later on, we'll see though that there is reason to believe that this is especially a strong material here. I will say just as a general observation is that the dead space suits have a lot more armor than is probably necessary. Although in this scenario, that actually does come in quite handy. Another recurring theme encountered early on is the low railings in the docking bay of the Ishimura, especially over these very high vantage points and in places where there will be heavy cargo moved around. Definitely would want to have more secure guide rails to prevent people from falling off. Again, this is slightly offset by the use of the unified field theory for artificial gravity controls, but even for ships intended to have artificial gravity should also be designed for safety in the event that gravity were to fail for whatever reason. As with any good spaceship, the Ishimura has double airlock doors so that in the event of a hull breach that is able to seal off that section and prevent the atmosphere from escaping in adjoining sections. The emergency lighting throughout the ship could probably use a bit of work. On the one hand, exits should be clearly illuminated in the event of an evacuation, but also the path to get to the exit should also be visible as well. Also, cutting the lights in an emergency situation is probably not a good idea. Same can be said for the quarantine system, which makes sense for keeping in potentially hazardous objects or scenarios, but again, cutting the lights doesn't help anything here. Throughout the ship, we also see a large amount of unsecured cargo that poses a hazard in the event of gravity failure, where you have large massive objects that could be thrown around and potentially impact somebody. Although given the present state of the ship, this is somewhat understandable. In any case though, cargo securement should be considered so you don't have large objects floating around. Especially when balancing the mass of a spacecraft as well, which probably isn't as much of a concern for a ship as large as the Ishimura. But having unsecure mass can change the center of gravity of a spaceship, which can make calculations of its flight path more difficult or inaccurate. You can see that there are lockers for securing cargo in some places, as well as in various parts of the ship, dedicated securements for cargo, but they're definitely not universal. One thing that can be noticed pretty early on is the use of blue and orange colors in the user interface and hologram displays. This is a particularly nice choice, not only because orange and blue are fairly complementary colors, but also because that these are colors that are commonly seen in the environment of Earth. So because humans are typically adapted to living on Earth, at least in the current time, blue light is especially useful in maintaining a circadian rhythm and helping you know when is daytime, essentially. In space where the day and night cycle can be altered if it's present at all, uh, blue light can be helpful for establishing a sleep and wake times for people who are not otherwise experiencing sunrise and sunset. Likewise, yellow and orange light is helpful on the opposite effect, whereas here we usually encounter that color of light when it's getting dark and we're turning lights on. So yellow and orange light can also be helpful for maintaining a circadian rhythm when it's time to go to sleep. These Earth-like colors are also a nice departure from the otherwise dark and metallic industrial environment too, giving it a bit more comfortable of a setting. Throughout the game, we can see that the Ishimura has a mostly consistent overall industrial aesthetic, which, while it looks cool for a game, is pretty harsh and probably uncomfortable for long duration living in such an environment. It's also generally hazardous due to sharp edges and high potential for injury, especially in the event of a sudden knock or impact to the ship, or, as I've mentioned already, if gravity were to fail. Emergency phones are widely available to allow for an easy call for help if an accident were to occur, although this particular implementation of these phones is not the most secure system, as we'll see in future chapters. The lengthwise tram system used for transporting people and cargo from one end of the ship to the other definitely makes sense for a vessel of this size. However, the fact that there is only one line servicing the entire ship seems like a bit of an oversight. While it's not necessarily very clear that this is the only tram on the entire ship, 
The fact that it's the only one used in the story and that is referenced multiple times that this tram needs to be repaired to progress suggests that this is the only tram on the ship. Vents into engineering. You got a stasis module handy? We need one in tram maintenance stat. The autoloader's fried. I got a damaged tram car on the tracks, and if the whole system's gridlocked, guess who they're calling? This is bound to interfere with timely transportation from one part of the ship to the other, as well as emergency evacuations where people need to get off the ship quickly. The lack of redundancy of a single tram line is a problem enough, but at the very least there is a system for replacing damaged tram cars, which is utilized in this first chapter. Frequent save stations offer an opportunity to record accidents or noteworthy occurrences on the ship, and the use of physical media, as can be seen from this disk drive on the side here, is also a good idea, considering that disk-based media is not subject to damage from radiation as electronic storage is which is especially useful for preserving information on spaceborne systems. Throughout the ship, there are a fair amount of warning signs present. However, they're definitely not universal. There is also an abundance of these loosely secured metal fans throughout the ship for ventilation purposes. In case it's not obvious why metal bladed fans aren't as common as they once were, this is a very serious cut hazard in the event that one of these were to come loose and impact somebody, or if somebody were to just fall into one of the vents. That would be very unfortunate if one of these blades were to impact somebody. The stasis module and associated technology is never really explained in Dead Space, although it could be assumed that the time slowing effects could have something to do with the distortion of space in a localized area, tying it back in with the unified field theory, theoretically and to some extent arbitrarily for the purposes of in-game consistency. Distorting space in a localized region could also result in distortion of time within that region. So perhaps the stasis system is an, a controlled application of this distortion effect. However, this is mostly speculation, and unless that is how this system operates, then it is going beyond the one miracle exception allowance. These high-speed doors seem to be utilizing some excessive force here, which really seems pretty unnecessary. The only thing I could think of for why you might want this is the event of a hull breach then the door needs to force its way closed to prevent the atmosphere from draining from a nearby section. Even then, this system is still extremely dangerous. If this were to fail when there is somebody trying to use the door, there could be catastrophic results for the person trying to pass through it. The locator system makes a lot of sense for a maze-like environment such as this, and always being able to find where you're supposed to be going is definitely helpful. However, if the ship is designed in such a way that a locator is necessary to find where you're supposed to be going, it probably could have had a much more intuitive floor plan. Something else that comes up fairly often is the lack of restraints with which one can secure themselves in the event of a gravity failure or if the ship rocks, like in Star Trek. For example, this chair here doesn't have any restraints to it, it's just a chair. Uh, you couldn't strap yourself in in the event of gravity failure or if there's some rough conditions for flying. There are a fair amount of things to grab onto around the ship, but not much that will actually secure you in place in the event that, that becomes necessary. Having these sort of circuit breakers for critical systems readily available around the ship allows them to be repaired more quickly in the event of a power failure. Instead of having to go to a dedicated electrical room or a place that's out of the way, uh, the problem could possibly be fixed right on the spot. There are quite a few volatile and hazardous chemicals that are just lying around the ship that are both not in secure storage and also just not secured to the ship itself. This poses obvious toxic and ignition hazards, especially in the event of a gravity failure where these chemical containers could just be floating around and impact something at high velocities and explode. One of the more egregious problems I noticed while playing this is that during the course of the game, I was able to hear announcements over the PA system in Spanish, French, Chinese, German, Russian, English, and possibly Italian. The problem with this multiple language system is ensuring situational awareness among all crew members who need to be informed about what's going on. For example, if there is an emergency scenario and everybody needs to get out of a certain room, but not everybody can understand the language being spoken, not everyone is going to understand the situation well enough to be immediately informed of the hazard, and so some people might not be able to get out of the situation quickly enough or understand what's going on. I suppose this could potentially be useful for contacting only certain crew members, 
but the utility of this is probably not greater than the hazard posed by limiting the information available to all crew members at a certain time. It's a bit odd that all the lights here happen to be on one circuit and there's no backups. Also, there's a general lack of emergency lighting in this room and others that have this similar sort of circuit breaker situation. In keeping with the industrial aesthetic of the game, there are some pretty overly complex vending machines throughout the ship, which is kind of cool looking, but in general, uh, they are probably overcomplicated for their purpose. Engineers typically try to reduce complexity of systems rather than making them unnecessarily complex. The suit upgrade station, while a cool idea, definitely has potential for injuries for anybody who would be inside the station and not properly secured. Uh, it really would be a shame if that were to happen to somebody. Having loose cables on the ground like this is just an obvious trip and electrocution hazard. We'll come across these unsecured shelves quite a bit throughout the ship, which further illustrates that there's a lot of cargo on board that is not secured and could potentially be hazardous in the event of a gravity failure or sudden shock. The Kinesis module is the prime example of the usefulness of the unified field theory. It allows you to remotely move massive objects that would otherwise be difficult to move using traditional means. As we've already seen, this would be especially useful for industrial applications. However, the ability to lift and move large massive objects without much resistance could easily pose hazards to anybody nearby that might not be aware of the operations going on or just happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Especially considering the speed with which the Kinesis module can launch these objects. In place of railings or anything to keep people from falling off the loading deck, the tram station utilizes these folding shutters, the safety aspect of which could probably be improved. The tram also continues the industrial design theme of the ship, although it does seem to be rather heavily armored for its application. This safety equipment has clearly not been inspected, which is a great hazard for anybody who is in need of safety equipment from this particular station. There's a poster in this area for the security phones to indicate that they can be used for security assistance as well as emergency support. While this is clearly a good thing to have these posters available to provide information about ship systems, they're not very common throughout the ship. This waiting room design is not very friendly looking. Similarly to the security phone poster, these signs indicating that counseling is available only seem to show up in the medical section of the ship, which is good on the one hand, but they also probably ought to be placed throughout the rest of the ship as well. More specifically to space travel purposes, having psychological treatment options is definitely more important when you're in a confined environment of a spaceship for a long period of time, as this sort of activity does have a noticeable psychological impact. On this ship at least, being alone for an extended period of time, or in a small crew, is not as much of a concern, but being a great distance from Earth or wherever else the crew members might call home could still be a source of mental strain during long trips into deep space. This large, apparently electromagnetic scanning system is right in the middle of a primary walkway. While it can be moved out of the way using Kinesis, this is still a strange design for a walkable area. There's a wiring diagram on the inside of this junction box that any electrical engineers watching might have more fun with than I did. The fact that this ceiling is collapsed could be an indication that it was not very structurally sound to begin with, or that there was a rather large impact on it that was in excess of its rated loads. It's a bit hard to tell here though, so I think we can give it the benefit of the doubt. At several points throughout the game, we can see that the ship has a universal coordinated time across the entirety of the vessel. This makes sense, as when you're far away enough from civilization, it might make more sense to have your own schedule for operations on board the ship, rather than rely on the clock of a distant planet. There are multiple medical logs that can be found during the game, including details on patient medical conditions and interactions with their doctors. None of these logs are secured, which would seem to make doctor-patient confidentiality more difficult. On several occasions, we can find these posters about safe usage of stasis, where they say an engine in stasis is a safe engine, which, sure, as long as the engine remains in stasis. Considering that these stasis systems only tend to operate on the order of a few seconds at a time, considering an engine in stasis to be safe is a bit presumptuous. As we'll see throughout the game, the cargo lifts that are used to transport people and cargo between floors are generally not very secure, without much in the way of railings 
or handles to hold onto while you're riding them. Going back to the earlier discussion of blue and orange lighting, this sort of sterile white lighting is much less comforting or relaxing from a warmer orange light, sort of like the difference between incandescent and LED bulbs. This might not be a big deal for short-term exposure, such as on the medical decks, but speaking from experience, having a bland white environment for an extended period of time does get a little bit old. In this first zero gravity section, we can see that the ship's artificial gravity can be disabled or fail in localized sections of the ship. Fortunately, thanks to the metal deck, crew members could walk around using magnetic boots. There is a very subtle change in the lighting upon transitioning from a vacuum environment to an atmosphere. This actually has some physical basis, as light will be slightly distorted when traveling through air versus traveling through a vacuum. This distortion takes the form of absorption and scattering, and can actually be most easily seen in 3D rendering, in which volumetric absorption and scattering can have an effect on the final look of a scene. To an extent, this is also something that would need to be considered during spacewalk activities, in which your eyes are used to seeing objects through an atmosphere, whereas in the absence of air, your perception of distance is slightly altered, and so this is another thing that takes some getting used to when you go into space. One of my favorite examples of attention to detail in this game is the condensation on Isaac's suit upon re-entering an atmosphere from a vacuum. When entering a vacuum, frost will appear on the suit as a result of the rapid cooling of the air near the surface of the suit, causing water to condense and freeze onto the suit. When returning to a warm atmosphere, the frost melts, leaving a wet effect on the armor, which eventually evaporates. It's not an especially complex mechanic, but I really appreciate the detail. In a medical officer's log, we can see that the ship is equipped with zero-g therapy pods for use in treating medical and psychological issues. This makes sense in terms of treating some medical conditions such as heart issues, as the heart doesn't need to work as hard to pump blood in zero gravity. However, there are a number of health problems that the human body encounters upon exposure to zero gravity, for an extended period of time at least. Fortunately, most of these conditions take a fair amount of time to begin manifesting, so for a short duration, zero gravity could perhaps be useful. Even so, in most people who travel to space, they generally experience something known as General Space Adaptation Syndrome, which is essentially very, very bad motion sickness. I'm an engineer, not a doctor, but if there were medical benefits to zero gravity, even over short periods of time, the likely nausea and headaches that would be caused by General Space Adaptation Syndrome might seem to reduce their usefulness for psychological treatment. You can see here that we have a large pipe of liquid hydrogen flowing right past a line of oxygen, as well as return air and heat exchanger with hot metal warning signs. This is all the right ingredients for an explosion, especially considering that the oxygen line is leaking. These pipes are also directly above a walkway where somebody could easily bump into or damage them. Something with so much explosive potential should probably be better secured. We've got a nice Star Trek reference here to transparent aluminum that apparently is what's being used for the windows on the ship. This goes back to the discussion of the Kellyon Bridge, where the windows are pretty large, but if considering how structurally sound they seem to be even after the crash, it makes a bit more sense knowing that there are transparent metallic alloys in use. Besides the obvious electrocution hazard of these exposed high-voltage fuses, there is potential for these important circuits to be interrupted inadvertently by flying random objects in the event of a gravity failure, or somebody shooting them with a plasma cutter. But on the other side, at least there is ready access to these critical systems in the event that they need to be repaired. Maybe it's just me, but this poster doesn't seem very welcoming. Once again, we have another critical door malfunction that is exerting excessive force in trying to close. This is... Clearly a safety hazard. Yeah, not much else to say. <laughs> the quarantine system, once again, makes sense in a medical setting, but the fact that all the lights turn off is not really going to be helping much. There are no stairs connecting the two floors of this primary medical lab. Instead, there's only a single cargo lift and an alternative route that goes through some back hallways and other laboratories. This could especially be a problem if there was an emergency on one floor or the other and, you know, someone needs to get between them quickly. And if the cargo lift is out of order, there may be no way to get to the other floor in time. This personal medical log detailing a patient's condition is left unsecured in a public restroom. Given that this is 500 years in the future, while the hologram technology is not the best resolution, at the very least, it seems that they are able to project a hologram from a single point rather than from multiple projectors. How exactly they're doing this isn't really my specialty, but I don't think this falls under a miracle exception considering how far ahead in the future it is. The biological prosthetic center of the medical deck appears to be based on the premise of 
growing human bodies for a purpose of obtaining organs for transplantation, up to and including full limbs, it seems. While this technically makes sense and could work in practice, there's bound to be an abundance of ethical issues that I'm sure that they have disregarded or figured out by now. The hydrazine bomb that Isaac uses to blast open this barricade in the medical wing operates by detonating a hydrazine canister using a medical electric shock pad system. Since the hydrazine is still secured in its vessel, assuming it's not leaking at this point, it wouldn't necessarily ignite on its own because there's no exposed oxygen. However, if the shock pads are generating a sufficient current through the, the canister, and potentially even arcing through the gas within it, this could cause the gas to expand beyond the failure stress of the canister, exposing it to the oxygen of the air. And the end result would still be an explosion, so that part makes sense. There is a circuit breaker here that can switch between the lights or blast doors over the showers. Okay. Regardless of how the stasis system operates in this universe, it appears that some sort of singularity can be contained in these capsules that causes a stasis effect in its surrounding area upon disruption. When a hull breach occurs, the immediate area is sealed off using blast doors. This is a particularly effective automated system to prevent decompression of the entire area and could be accomplished easily enough with pressure sensors in the room. At the end of the chapter, we find out that the Ishimura has entered a decaying orbit thanks to the large mass of rock from the planet that it's pulling with it. Isaac. I'm here. What the hell's happening? The computer says the Ishimura's engines are offline. We're on a decaying orbit toward Aegis 7. Oh god. I have to get to engineering. Essentially what's happening is that the Ishimura is no longer able to maintain the velocity required to keep within a stable orbit around the planet, thanks to the engines being offline. There is a poster in the tram for a Gliese Beach travel destination. This is probably a reference to the planet Gliese 581c, which was an early contender for a possible Earth-like exoplanet. Considering that this travel poster indicates that it is a beach destination, it's also possible that this is the planet Inea Posha, orbiting Orcaria. I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce that properly. Officially known as GJ1214b, which is suspected to be largely comprised of water. As far as Georgia 4, I am not sure where this could be located, but considering this takes place 500 years in the future, it's possible it could be any, just about anywhere. At the beginning of Chapter 3, we get a chance to go back and look at the Kellyon up close after its collision. There are several notable features about the ship, but one particularly interesting aspect of its design is the engine nozzles. For traditional chemical propulsion systems utilizing a gaseous propellant, most rocket engines use de Laval nozzles, which are smoothly curved so as to allow the flow of gas to be turned into the correct flow pattern for exhausting at maximum velocity. Here though, we can see that the Kellyon engine nozzles are not smooth, in fact, are rather blocky. One possible explanation for this is that the Kellyon uses fusion-based engines, which instead of traditional de Laval nozzles, it would use a magnetic confinement nozzle system. This controlled application of magnetic fields produces converging and diverging effect similar to a de Laval nozzle, but does not require contact with the physical nozzle itself. One possible supporting detail for the use of fusion engines here is the design of these engines, which could perhaps be relating to the use of a direct fusion drive, in which magnetic plasma confinement systems are used to superheat propellant. Of course, this is more speculation though, as this technology being so far into the future makes it difficult to guess how such technology might actually be implemented. Plasma propulsion is a very advanced science, and there's a lot of it that I don't understand still, so I'll hold off on saying for sure that this is a fusion system, but I can say for sure that these are not effective nozzles for chemical propulsion, or at least in exhausting gases in a traditional manner. We can also see that, as mentioned before, the large view screen of the Kellyon has been destroyed, indicating that perhaps even with the inclusion of transparent aluminum, this is still a structural weak point in the ship. We can also see what looks like where a loading ramp might be deployed underneath the ship, in addition to the access doors on the sides of the ship. Turning our attention back to the Ishimura, Unlike much of the ship's interior, we can at least see in this docking bay area that much of these heavy cargo containers are secured to the ship. However, there is still a decent amount of unsecured volatile chemical containers floating around, which is not good. 
These atmospheric shields show up occasionally in science fiction and are rather confusing from a physical point of view, since they allow large solid objects to pass through unimpeded but prevent the diffusion of gas through the barrier. Considering that applications of the unified field theory are available at this point, we could suppose that this shield makes use of some sort of diffusion blocking system where particles of gas are held inside through some advanced means. It's good to see that there are emergency reserves of oxygen in areas where people might be working outside in the vacuum of space, and that they are readily available near high traffic areas. Yet another example of why these metal fans are so dangerous. If anything were to get caught in the fan blades, it could be stuck and damaged, and possibly also lead to the creation of sparks from the fan, which could ignite something. In the interest of safety, at least the engineering crew are keeping track of how many days it's been since an incident. Engineering log, acting chief engineer Jacob Temple reporting. Christ, I still can't believe the chief is gone. It's all fallen apart since the captain died. Everyone down here is on their last nerve. We thought the rioting was the worst of it. Until those things came through the vents. Their faces. I mean, fuck, those were my lunch buddies. Liz's friends. Old boyfriends. And out of nowhere, the engines are screwed. Primaries laboring, we're hemorrhaging fuel. Fuck if I know why. I'm taking Danvers to the fuel depot to fix it. Gotta keep the team focused or it will crack. Temple out. <laughs> From this series of audio logs from the acting chief engineer Jacob Temple, we can see he is trying to keep the crew focused on maintaining the ship and preventing the engines from failing entirely. Even in such a terrible situation as this, as a wise man once said, in times of stress, honest labor helps put the mind at ease. And having a task to focus on instead of being overwhelmed by the severity of the situation would at least be helpful for keeping people focused and not spiraling out of control. Seeing you in the control room. Any news on the engines? Yeah, but it makes no sense. They're out of fuel. The centrifuge is offline. We're tethered to a four trillion ton payload. Without the engines, it's dragging us down to the planet. Can you handle it alone? Sure. Fix the centrifuge, get the fuel running, then do a full restart. But you'll need the stabilizer orbit from there. Standing by. Fast as you can, Isaac. <laughs> From the ship diagnostics report, we find out that the engines are offline and the ship is still carrying a large mass of rock from the planet that is pulling it into a lower orbit. As mentioned earlier, what's happening here is the engines are not powerful enough to maintain orbital velocity for the total mass of the ship and the rock itself. Simply dropping the rock would be an effective way of keeping them in orbit a little longer without engines, but as we come to find out later, dropping the rock would require administrative override, which is apparently more important than keeping the ship in orbit. While it might be rather atmospheric, this is not a very convenient way to store your uniforms. The water lines on this ship could probably use some maintenance, as this is not the first time or the last that these showers malfunction right when somebody walks past them. We can see in this machine shop area that there is some very large equipment suspended somewhat precariously right over and next to a walkable area. This is definitely not a safe way of storing things, even if they are going to be commonly accessed, as any failure of the supports or restraints could result in somebody getting crushed. We can see that the engine room has these very long drops, for some reason, without sufficient railings guarding against falling over into them. While watching our step over this large drop without any railings, you can see here another valuable use of the kinesis module in retrieving a stuck tram from out in the middle of the room, instead of having to bring in a bunch of support equipment to reach over the tram mechanically. What appears to be happening with this engine refueling sequence is that the engine has a primary propellant reserve that is directly fed into the engine itself, and in addition also has reserve propellant storage in a separate location. Once the primary feed is exhausted, a new supply of propellant is provided from these reserves. So since there is still propellant left in the reserve tanks, all we need to do here is connect them back up to the primary propellant feed and transfer the propellant in using what appears to be a turbo pump mechanism. While this does include more moving parts and potential failure points, this turret system makes a lot of sense for fuel storage in that it allows tanks to be removed and refueled independently from the reserves being still able to resupply the primary propellant feed. Last valve done, Chief! Progress report filed by Jacob Temple. The engine problems aren't a malfunction. Someone shut off the fuel lines to the primary engine and damaged the valves to hell and back. 
We just wasted an hour fixing them. Now we need to restart the south refueling station, but some jackass turned off the power and locked up the circuit breaker. No engines? We're gonna hit planet fall soon. What now? There's gotta be someone around here how to spare access card. Go see. Wait, you hear that? Never go! Considering the size of these engines and apparently the severity to which they were damaged, it's impressive that two people alone were able to fix them in just one hour. So, bravo, Jacob. I suspect that these occasional Earth posters here are placed in a similar manner to the motivational posters that are stereotypically seen in offices, since being so far away from Earth without a way to get back anytime soon is already a source of stress enough without being reminded of that fact. Nice to see that filmmaking is still alive and well 500 years in the future. The fact that life support and the lighting systems are both on the same circuit and share the same power supply does not seem like an effective wiring scheme, as clearly life support is more important than lighting. That being said, at least we can also see here that the important cables for these systems are colored for high visibility. We can also see that if you do choose to turn off the life support here, the entire room's life support cuts out at once which doesn't really make sense for such a huge space as this that all the air would suddenly disappear. For such a large room as this, it makes sense to have a gondola to go from one side of the room to the other, but considering that this appears to be the only effective way of crossing the room, seems like an oversight from a safety perspective, as if the gondola is out of order and people need to cross the gap to get to an exit, they're going to have some trouble. Just a minute ago, Hammond said that the tanks are only a quarter full, whereas this indicator says that the tanks are full. There seems to be some discrepancy somewhere. For some reason, the gravity centrifuge requires decontamination before accessing it. This seems a bit odd, considering that the system appears to be fairly robust. Uh, the only thing I can think of would be in case there is electromagnetically sensitive equipment inside that even dust could interfere with. Although considering the state of the room as we see it here, and the fact that we can still activate the gravity centrifuge, it appears that that is not the case. From another engineering log from Jacob Temple, we can deduce that the gravity centrifuge is used to balance the ship when it is in possession of such a large piece of rock from the planet. There's actually some realistic basis for this, as one system that is currently in use for controlling a spaceship's positioning is a control moment gyro, which are used to adjust a spacecraft's heading by application of torque through the spinning of a rotor. This gets into guidance, navigation, and control systems for spacecraft, which is fairly advanced. However, with the presence of only a single gravity centrifuge, the torque produced is going to be about a single axis and as such would be limited in the way that it can be used to control the attitude of the Ishimura. It is possible, I guess, that the two arms of the centrifuge could be able to swing in opposite directions if necessary, depending on what sort of control input is needed for keeping the ship on its trajectory. And perhaps here, the ship was in such a bad state that it needed both of the arms to be swinging in this direction to pull itself up into orbit. One other nice attention to detail and a neat game mechanic is that when walking close to an interactable object, Isaac will turn his head to look at it. In addition to just being a cool game mechanic, which did save me a few times from missing items, this illustrates how having visual indicators of important systems can be used to draw attention to them. You can also see that for a walkable area, these gravity centrifuge walkways do not have railings on them of any sort, for the most part. While the severity of this is limited by the fact that it is currently in zero gravity, as we'll see, there are a lot of other hazards in this room having to do with the walkways. When the centrifuge is reactivated, we can see that for some reason, the arms of the centrifuge swing directly over the walkable areas that would be used to get to the control panel. You have a very massive object moving at high speeds directly into areas where personnel might be walking or might need to walk in some situation. Point being, this is extremely unsafe and I really can't think of a good explanation for why this would even be a good idea. Access to the engine fuel storage is behind a double airlock system, complete with warning signs, PPE requirements, and hazard indicators. While this is all great here, this should be the norm throughout the ship, and it is very much the exception and not the rule. In this ventilation room, I suppose, we see that there is another walkway without railings over it. However, at least here, the premise is that this room is supposed to be in zero gravity, so this makes a little bit more sense. We also see these giant fans without any sort of shielding or protective system to prevent people from being injured by them, which they might be because on the other side of these fans, there is a circuit breaker that someone might need to access for repairs. 
there is no noise warning before accessing the loud engine room coming from this quiet access corridor, which for one is a noise hazard and two is also annoying when even just playing the game. Once again, another critical door malfunction. At this point, there really should just be some sort of emergency stop button to just force stop these doors when such a problem as this occurs. Considering some of the crazy tools we have at our disposal in this game, a manual riveter doesn't really seem like the most impressive thing to put on a poster. So, inside the engine room, we have this very large, apparently fusion-based combustion system that is located immediately above a walkable area with no sort of protection for people walking underneath it. Not to mention the fact that you are walking directly beneath the combustion chamber to which the room is exposed, which is bound to release excessive heat and possibly even radiation. Now, at the very least, we have a heat warning on the outside of the room, but having a warning sign and having preventative measures are not the same thing. We can see from this ship plaque on the bridge that the Ishimura took three years for construction, from 2443 to 2446. The keel being the primary structural component of the ship, as well as the historical indication of when construction on a ship begins. Considering the size and scope of the systems aboard the Ishimura, as well as the structure of the ship itself, this is a quite an impressive feat, even for 400 years in the future. We get to see more of that transparent aluminum at work here. Like the Kellyon, at the Ishimura bridge we see a large number of windows, which we'll assume going forward is transparent aluminum. In the absence of active measures of preventing asteroids from impacting the ship, at the very least, it is nice that they have an automated system for closing up hull breaches on the bridge. You okay? At least containment and life support are holding. So far. If we can assume that the bridge windows are facing the bow of the ship, and remembering that we were able to see Aegis 7 from the gravity centrifuge, then it's a little strange that the planet is also visible now and directly in front of the ship. Although there are a number of explanations for this as the bridge might not be facing forward or the gravity centrifuge might also be facing in the same direction as the bridge. Speaking as someone who has on multiple occasions made a serious attempt to use the Elite Motion Controller for productivity work, the lack of tactile controls on these holographic terminals is probably not the most optimal way to interface with ship systems. In order to access the bridge escape pods, this cargo lift must first be used to access the escape pod deck. Such a vital safety system as escape pods need to be easily accessible in the event of an emergency. And this is very much the opposite of that. In this chapter, we also find more chairs without securements that could be used to secure yourself to the chair in the event of a gravity failure. Also, in my personal opinion, these just don't look very comfortable. Here we can see a problem with these automatic doors based on proximity, and that the door to this evacuated room will not close until a person is clear of it, when clearly I'm trying to get air at this moment. The analog displays at this terminal appear to only be indicating 7 bits of information, whereas today 8 bits is the standard. Any computer scientists watching and interested enough can try to decipher these blinking lights here. Considering the state of the ship, the fact that the system is only tracking 188 safety violations feels like it's missing a few things. But I guess I'll have to come back here after making this video and see if this number is accurate. Apparently, the power surges on this deck are so great that they are able to shoot lightning out of these deck plates. I'm not enough of an electrical engineer to know if this is even possible, but the fact that such high voltage systems are so close to a walkable area without sufficient insulation Again, another terrible safety decision. True, they are more accessible for ease of repair. It seems like repairs should only be carried out if the power is completely disabled on this deck. It seems a little convenient that these circuit breakers are able to divert power in just the manner required to reactivate the asteroid defense system. However, it could be that this is a known contingency, such that if the asteroid defense cannons need to be repowered, or if there's a power routing failure, then these decks can be shut off to supply power to more critical systems. Even when not considering the hazardous electrical panels all over the floor, the floor plan of this electrical systems room is not very well thought out. Furthermore, these hexadecimal displays don't seem to be movable either, suggesting that these displays are just permanent fixtures and you're supposed to walk around them in this maze-like arrangement. It's nice to see that there is a mostly clearly visible poster detailing evacuation instructions. 
It's too bad this is basically the only one on the ship. In a surprising bit of attention to detail, you can see that this panel box here has a tag indicating that somebody has been using it recently and signed off on the tag in a lockout takeout system. This is to make sure everyone is aware of what repairs are being performed on a system and when those repairs are being performed. While there is a physical basis for the motion of these cables due to electromagnetic forces, such forces would only occur if there is a current flowing through the cables, and we can see that they are both severed. Unless there is a severe amount of feedback current, then these cables shouldn't really be moving. In what I can only explain as a game design goof, this asteroid appears to have crashed through only one of the multiple ceilings above this deck. How it got inside the other ceiling, I don't know. Another recurring theme are these rather pointless seeming sharp metal ventilation covers that are present throughout much of the ship. Just walking past these things is a hazard, as if the ship rocks or shakes for any reason, you could very easily bump your head on one of these or slice it open. Not to mention the event of a gravity failure, in which case you might have to use the walls to move around, you could very easily cut yourself on one of these. Definitely not a safe design. We got it. The ADS cannons are back online. We... Wait. Auto-targeting offline. Calibration data not found. Fuck. No auto-targeting. The cannons are useless. What about manual targeting? You want to go out there with all that shit raining down and target the ADS cannons manually? If I give the cannons enough targeting data, it'll recalibrate the system. You got a better idea? Christ. I'll open exterior access. I hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> For some reason, it appears that the asteroid defense system cannons have lost their calibration data. So to fix them, Isaac uses manual targeting to retrain the system on how it needs to operate. Apparently, this is making use of some sort of machine learning and showing the computer system how to recognize incoming asteroids and destroy them in time. How exactly the computer lost the calibration data and why it has to be performed for each cannon individually is a little odd, though. For such an important system as exterior oxygen availability, it's nice to see that this is a redundant system here. The asteroid defense cannons seem to be using some sort of high explosive projectiles launched through a traditional chemical propulsion system, aka really big guns. We can tell it's not an electromagnetic system because there's a muzzle flash upon firing, where the hot gases from the propellant are expelled. Also, for some reason, there is a laser beam pointing at where the cannon is aiming, even though we are currently in the vacuum of space, where there's no medium for this laser to be reflecting back to us. There's a lot of backtracking in Chapter 5, so this one will be pretty short. We see in this chapter that the space-time distortion of the stasis effect is not injurious to human life, and that somehow the stasis shot applies to all of Isaac simultaneously, but not surrounding objects. It's fortunate that the medical deck has backup ventilation systems, although it is rather inconvenient that they can only be accessed from a single location, especially considering the possibility of airborne pathogens being released in the medical deck. Proper ventilation should be a priority, and backups are definitely essential for this sort of thing. The cryogenics room has this large freezing chamber that uses liquid nitrogen to rapidly freeze its contents. Again, I'm not a doctor, but the only thing I could think that this would be useful for would be for some sort of cryogenic preservation operations to freeze a whole person. But even in that case, this chamber seems rather large if that's the intended purpose. Variety is important in both balancing your nutritional intake as well as in plant selection for crop rotation purposes. However, it appears that based on this section of the hydroponics deck, there only appear to be four plants that are being grown throughout this deck. That being pumpkins, tomatoes, corn, and watermelons. For such a large ship as this, it seems like there should be more variety of plants that are available both for nutrition and for crop rotation purposes. Curiously, though, we do see apples and bananas show up on the ship throughout the game as well. Where did they come from? Using two primary grow chambers allows for different conditions to be maintained on either side. And as we'll see later, this allows for some research applications as well. This enzyme centrifuge is not spinning while it's activated, although we can chuck this up to just a game design optimization. It's also rather convenient that liquid nitrogen was the only missing ingredient for the synthesis, but I'm not a microbiologist, so I'll let it go. We can finally see some padding on the walls to prevent injury in the case that somebody were to fall into them at too high velocity, although there are still some sharp objects throughout the wall surface. 
It's a shame that these aren't more common throughout the ship. This flow control room has several piping systems that are venting directly into a walkway. Upon closer inspection, it appears that this is intentional, as this seems to be some sort of directional nozzle here. Even in the best case scenario, where this is just plain water being vented out, you're still going to be spraying water onto a walkable area, leading to a wet floor and potential slip hazards. Worst case scenario, if this is some sort of hazardous or corrosive chemical, you're going to be directly harming people who might be walking in the way. And as previously mentioned, the presence of warning signs and auditory hazard indicators are not the same thing as actual preventative measures. If you have to be venting liquid somewhere, at least don't put it directly into a walkable area. In addition to the valuable recycling of carbon dioxide into oxygen, not to mention on-site food production, plants can provide a psychological benefit to space environments by creating an environment more reminiscent of Earth. For a ship as large as the Ishimura designed to be traveling way out into deep space, these plants would be better suited spread throughout the ship so that more crew members are able to experience the benefits that plants in space would offer. I was going to talk about the benefits of including insects in the biosphere of the hydroponics deck here, but it turns out that this is just an auditory ambience system. At least it does provide some psychological benefits, I suppose, as it, w it is much more calming to be hearing a more natural environment, instead of just the constant hum of machinery. There's another emergency evacuation poster. However, this is not in the main common space of the hydroponics deck and is instead off to the side of one of the labs. Here we see what's probably another game design optimization in that the gas in these rooms does not diffuse through the open door. Realistically, you should be able to just vent the gas from these rooms by opening the doors and allowing the gas to flow out, but here we can see that that's not the case. Also, once the ventilation systems are reactivated, the gas is clear from these rooms rather surprisingly fast. I never asked your name. Isaac Clark, systems engineer. Engineer? Have you seen Jacob Temple? At least in this version, Isaac is apparently a systems engineer, which focuses on integration of systems into a cohesive whole throughout an engineering application. This is more of a higher level role than a designer or test or manufacturing, and considering his technical skills in this and other Dead Space games, it might have made more sense for him to be an electrical engineer, or in my humble opinion, the best type of engineer, mechanical. Just don't tell the civil engineers, they're probably not watching by now anyways. It's becoming quite a common trend at this point that we see these unsafe cargo lift elevators throughout the ship, and yet again here in the hydroponics deck. One rather odd design feature of this room, however, is that there is a fair amount of inaccessible growth chambers. Uh, while the ones on the walls could be considered accessible from the other side of the wall, these towers in the center of the room don't really appear to be accessible by any means that are shown here. While this does make for a cool visual design style, this lighting system inside the cooling tower access tunnel doesn't really make a whole lot of practical sense. The only thing I could think of was if that it is supposed to prevent light from heating up areas of the tunnel too much, but even then, there's probably better ways to do it than a moving mechanical system that is going to have multiple failure points. There are also exposed tubes in these tunnels that are going to result in uneven heating, or cooling rather, compared to the more securely mounted tubes and pipes. Upon entering the refrigeration core, we see a warning sign for the cryogenic systems area, as well as an atmospheric barrier to prevent cooled air from diffusing into the warmer atmospheric section. On the other side of this atmospheric barrier, we're also entering a zero gravity environment. This actually does make a lot of sense for a dedicated cooling region, as in the absence of gravity, convective heat transfer is going to be reduced. In the presence of gravity, heating of a gas causes its density to be reduced. Due to this reduction in density, the gas becomes lighter, and so gravity will pull down the colder gas below the hot gas. Hence the common phrase of heat rises. A more accurate expression of this saying would be that hot air rises. In the absence of gravity, however, the sinking of cold gas below the layer of hot gas does not occur because there's no gravitational force to move the heavier gas below the lighter gas. As such, you have reduced convective heat transfer in the absence of gravity. And so, for a system that is designed to be maintaining cold temperatures, having no gravity reduces the heat transfer from these cold systems into the atmosphere, allowing it to preserve its temperature better. While this is a classic element of video game design, these exposed spikes better have a good application because they're definitely a significant hazard to any personnel maneuvering in zero gravity here. Having meat lockers in these 
cooling towers allows the meat to be preserved using both vacuum packing and freeze drying. Although I do have to assume that this is lab grown meat considering that there is no ranch on board. Unlike the previous binary in display indicators, these appear to be using 8 bits instead of 7. So I'll leave this up for any computer scientists who want to attempt to decode this. Considering the condition of this room, it's a little bit surprising that it wasn't quarantined already. The East Growth Chamber has a system for disabling the gravity in the room, which could perhaps be useful for researching plant growth in zero gravity. There is a fair amount of research on this already, which has produced some interesting results. These thermodynamic purifiers appear to be intended to burn off impurities in the atmospheric air supply. Right now at least, they are way too dangerous for any personnel to actually be entering these rooms, but we do find out that this was done intentionally to prevent anything from crossing these paths. Still, if it's even possible for the system to become this dangerous, whether intentional or otherwise, there should be a much better security on these access doors than a easily damaged lock. Speaking of easily damaged, we see that these fuse systems are a known weak point of the ship systems. However, I suppose this could be intentional with the goal being that these fuses are easily replaceable. For some reason, there are liquid hydrogen lines in the food storage section, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless this is intended for use as radiation shielding, which liquid hydrogen is actually fairly effective for. For some reason, this food storage section also vents directly to the exterior. Not sure what the application of that would be. Nice to see a bit more wall padding throughout the ship, even if it's not very common still. These machines are vibrating pretty significantly, and the walkable space near them is not very well shielded. Even if these machines are supposed to be vibrating to this extent, the fact that there is such little shielding means that any disruption or breakage of these machines could result in injury to people walking by, such as if a object were to fly off and hit someone. These cargo tracks are an excellent use of kinesis to move large heavy objects around, but their application here is a little curious because these don't really seem to be moving anywhere important. They're also blocking access to a storage room, and having this room accessible might be important depending on what's stored in there. In what seems like a rarity, we get to see an effective safety poster in an effective location, as it is in a location that all workers on these decks will have to see. I was going to mention that this traps warning is another illustration of the problem of multiple voiceover languages, but I didn't realize at the time that it was an Easter egg. So, skull? The effectiveness of these asteroid mining lasers, at least as traps, seems to be a bit questionable considering they can be blocked by a simple metal crate. In this room we see another egregiously unsafe system, though it certainly won't be the last on this deck which is an ore processing matter transportation beam. It's easy enough to assume that this is some sort of unified field theory application to transport processed ore, but that isn't even the biggest problem here. For whatever reason, there are no shields between these moving rocks and the walkable surfaces, and the beam itself is not even confined. They even have a falling debris warning sign directly underneath the beam, instead of just simply putting a roof over the walkable area. At the very minimum, there should be some kind of barrier between these potentially heavy rocks moving it through the air and the walkable surface below. This battery socket has a high voltage warning sign, which is great, but like many of the other safety systems we've talked about so far, is not a common feature throughout the ship. In order to process the vast amounts of planetary material that are extracted in a planet cracking operation, these small chunks are broken off, which are pulled into the ship's mining center using gravity tethers. The chunks are then smoothed out into a sphere, and the ore extraction can begin using some sort of material extraction beam. We could assume that, using the unified field theory, ores of different density could be separated by their different responses to a gravitational field. That is to say, by their differing weights. Now it might seem a little petty, but one of the most significant errors I've found in this game, in my playthrough, is this mislabeling of these launch tubes as liquid hydrogen, return air, and heat exchangers. It might be a little pedantic, but the fact that this game is designed in such a way as to appeal to engineering-minded people, they should have expected engineers to actually take a look at this and be critical of it. So considering that, I'm going to be looking at the labels on pipes from now on and pointing out any inconsistencies I notice. There are conflicting flow indicators on this heat exchanger pipe connecting to this methane engine, 
And right on the other side of this walkway, we have an identical engine that is running off of liquid hydrogen, which seems curious. For a room on the mining deck where loose asteroids and debris are likely to be a common occurrence, this wall apparently is not structurally sound enough to prevent such objects from breaking through the wall and flying into the deck. So there's a lot to take in in this room. Uh, on the one hand, it's good that we have some fail-safe systems to prevent accidental injury to crew members working inside the mining bay, but that's about where my compliments end. You've got this high-energy matter transport beam that apparently is capable of vaporizing certain substances upon contact that is not confined except we're in this large room in which personnel are supposed to be able to work without any sort of protection system between them and the beam itself. The gravity failsafe doesn't even appear to be consistent either because it only is checking for these anomalous asteroids instead of any loose objects in the room. Once gravity is restored, we at least get some railings over these walkways, but one of these walkways has us traversing directly underneath the ore processing beam without any sort of shielding between the operator's head and the beam just a few feet away, if that. I can't think of any good reason why this would even be anywhere close to allowed, since there's no reason for somebody would need to reach up into the processing beam to pull out a rock or something like that. The point is, there should be a safer walkway around this room instead of having to go right up next to this high power transportation beam. I know I mentioned it earlier, but this entire corridor is just filled with these pointless wall filters that are a serious cut hazard. Also in this corridor, this door's emergency manual lever to open in the event of power loss doesn't seem to actually work without power. For some reason, there's a giant gap between these two platforms without any actual access to the other side, which at the very least is a poor floor plan design. There are also no railings on the other side, continuing the trend of unprotected ledges. This is likely due to just video game physics, but these objects that are on this deck when the gravity is disabled should not just float up into the air and hover in place. Since they are not moving before the gravity is disabled, they should remain at rest in the absence of gravity. The asteroids held by a few gravity tethers. There's no emergency shutdown. I'll have to disable them the hard way. We'll have the SOS beacon on the surface. Okay. As Isaac highlights, these gravity tethers have no emergency shutdown system which is just a clear safety problem, but also could be a challenge if the asteroid needs to be released suddenly due to a mechanical failure or if something becomes stuck. I'm gonna go on a limb and hope that these combustors are not supposed to be blasting fire over these walkable areas, especially since we saw earlier that they are operating with CO2, nitrogen, and natural gas, which is in a particularly combustive combination, and the presence of this somewhat ironic safety poster. In the interest of avoiding spoilers, I'll keep this chapter fairly short. Keeping the communications array room in zero gravity allows for repairs of these circuit systems to be performed more easily and more effectively, which is also improved by the clear indications on these antennae of which ones are still functional and which ones are burned out, as well as their circuit connection properties. Here we can also see a potential hazard of the Kinesis module, as using it in zero gravity can cause objects to be accelerated in an uncontrolled manner. No, something's blocking the blast doors over the comms array. The hell? There'll be a manual release over at maintenance. I'll go. Keep trying to reach them. For such a critical system as long-range communications, it makes sense that their antenna would be retractable to protect it from damage against asteroids, and it's also nice to hear that there is actually a manual release in the system, in the event that the automated systems fail. We got more of these spiky shutters along the length of this maintenance gondola, Although you could argue that it's less of a problem here since personnel going through this passageway would be within the confines of the gondola, ideally. 
Considering that this room includes a large window to view the exterior of the ship, it's fortunate that someone thought ahead to have an airlock door right behind this blast shield to prevent the atmosphere on the whole deck from being vented, at least unintentionally, in the event that the shield is ruptured. Daniels, what happened? Something shook the whole crew deck. What hit us? An asteroid? Having blast doors over the sleeping quarters in the barracks is an interesting design concept, but I suppose it makes sense for a military spaceship. Except for this one unlucky spot where they had to route the heat exchanger through the bunk. Unless I'm just being completely ignorant here, this pipe appears to be mislabeled as a fire hydrant, which I'm guessing is supposed to be fire hydrant. This isn't too much of a concern unless a fire hydrant is supposed to be something different from a fire hydrant, in which case this could cause confusion, especially in the event of an actual fire. Isaac, we have a problem. The Valor's carrying a 12 megaton warhead. The crash hit the torpedo bay hard. I need you to handle that nuke right away before something sets it off. Handle 12 megatons? You know I'm not a nuclear engineer, right? I don't need you to be. Just stabilize the warhead and eject it away from the Ishimura. Christ, Hammond. No one trained you to carve up monsters with a plasma cutter either. You haven't let us down yet. As a point of reference, based on my admittedly limited research, 12 megatons is 10 times the explosive yield of the largest nuclear weapon developed by the United States. For some reason, on a number of these bulkhead doors, we can see a pipe of carbon dioxide that circles around the door frame. I suppose that this could be for the purposes of extinguishing fires, but it seems like it's not doing a very good job at that, if that is the intended purpose. The supply water and nitrogen lines that run the length of this deck are mislabeled, or are apparently feeding into each other for some reason. We also have a water supply line that is leaking flammable gases for some reason. At least on this deck, we see a bit more redundancy in electrical systems, as there tend to be a duplicates of these power junction boxes right next to each other. If electrical systems can support redundancy, then that improves their resiliency against failure. Considering that humanity has yet to make first contact with extraterrestrial life in this timeline, this commander's response to the situation is pretty appropriate. This is Commander Cadigan to all hands. We have been boarded by hostile forces. Hostiles are aliens. Repeat, aliens. And extremely dangerous! All personnel to arms! Fire at will! In addition to just plain poor security over this torpedo bay door, this destructible fuse doesn't actually fit inside the fuse box. Since humans have no natural means of detecting ionizing radiation, it is important to have this auditory warning when the radiation is present. I'll say as a disclaimer here, I have not been in the military myself, but from the looks of it, these torpedoes are intended to be manually loaded into the launch tube, which considering their yields seems to be like a less than optimal solution. Fortunately, this torpedo didn't get loaded into a forward-facing torpedo tube, otherwise it might have simply impacted the Ishimura and this whole situation would have ended much differently. At least the Valor computer is tracking safety code violations, which seems to be an improvement over the Ishimura. There are some unsecured explosive canisters just sitting around in the armory, which is definitely not good. This live fire shooting range includes a section in which the targets are oriented such that the person running the course will be shooting directly towards the staging area. This is basic gun safety that you shouldn't be shooting towards places where people might be. There is an exposed helium pipe in the shooting range area in which bullets will be flying and potentially able to impact the pipe. Considering that helium being a noble gas is not very reactive and that the pressure of the gas in the pipe is very low, this might not be too big of a concern as far as safety unless this is a line for cryogenic liquid helium, which would be much more hazardous if it were to rupture in an area where personnel are working, as well as potentially problematic for any system that is being cooled by this liquid helium. Giving this system the benefit of the doubt, even if this is supposed to be some sort of amputation laser, there should be sufficient safeguards to make sure that such a dangerous system doesn't malfunction into the condition we see here. Unlike the Ishimura, we finally see a warning about loose cargo. Here we see a large line of nitric acid feeding directly into a return air pipe. If the name didn't clue you in, nitric acid is very corrosive and not good to breathe. 
It's also used as a rocket propellant, so it at least makes sense to be here, but this pipe is either mislabeled or not connected properly. As previously mentioned, having some sort of warning about radiation exposure is important. However, considering that this is extreme radiation, this poster probably isn't sufficient and should have some sort of numerical indication or other way of saying how dangerous this radiation is. Just like on the Ishimura, it's at least nice to see that there are warning signs about the hazardous conditions of the engine room, but as we'll see in a moment here, there definitely should be more safeguards instead of just a sign saying be careful. Before going into the safety concerns of this room, let's talk about the engine specs. Throughout the engine room, we see pipelines carrying liquid hydrogen and gaseous oxygen. While these are useful propellants for chemical propulsion systems, it appears that this engine is using them for an internal combustion process to generate electricity for the Singularity core. This generator appears to be using a 128-cylinder hydrogen-oxygen internal combustion engine. We can also infer from the fact that these pipes are flowing their contents down below the deck and then back up above it, that it is operating on some sort of expander cycle where the fuel or air is heated up before returning to the combustion chamber for increased thermodynamic potential. In order for this engine to be running continuously, we can assume that the exhaust from these hydrogen and oxygen combustions is released through these plasma exhaust jets. The fact that it occurs cyclically implies that there is some sort of storage system for holding onto the exhaust temporarily before it must be released. Or considering that earlier we hypothesized that this could be an expander cycle, we could suppose that this heated exhaust from the combustion chambers flows back over the inlet lines to, to preheat the incoming hydrogen and oxygen. Given strong enough materials, this might also explain why this plasma exhaust is flowing directly over these exposed hydrogen and oxygen lines, in that the system is designed to extract as much heat as possible from these propellants before they are exhausted. Now with the engine design out of the way, let's look at the safety aspect of the engine room. By the presence of these valves, we can infer that these walkways are intended to be placed here for easy access to the pipes for maintenance. However, there is no shielding between the walkway and the pipes themselves, meaning that especially if one of these lower pipes were to burst, they could easily take out somebody's legs, or worse. Also, I'm sure this is just a game design optimization again, but considering that these pipes appear to all be ruptured in about the same place, we could suppose that this is a designed failure point, and as such, these bursts will be venting potentially ignited liquid hydrogen out over the walkable area. And considering that this walkway is made of metal, it's going to heat up significantly and be difficult to walk on safely, due to temperature in addition to the flaming liquid hydrogen. There's also just a walkway that goes right out in front of the jet blast area, which is just clearly unsafe. There's no way that should have been allowed. Also, the piston heads of the engine located directly above the walkway are not shielded either, meaning that if one of them were to become dislodged or if there was some sort of sealing error, one of these pistons could be launched out directly into the walkway and impact somebody. We can see that there are access hatches in the walkways, so it's possible that there are other ways to navigate around here but it does still seem that these walkways are intended to be walkable areas for maintenance purposes. On the bright side, we do see that at least there is a fire suppression system and that would normally be accessible if before entering the engine room if it weren't for this debris that's in our way. Also, important safety tip, don't use a flamethrower in a room with leaking liquid hydrogen. If we are still working off the assumption that the shock point drive is an LQBR warp drive, then the exact mechanism of the singularity core is probably beyond scientific reasoning at this point. Uh, however, it could be assumed that this is some sort of spatial distortion device that is enabled by the unified field theory that is used to deliver negative mass to the outer region of the LQBR bubble. Perhaps it's just the only route remaining at this point in time, but as the sign says, in case of fire, do not use elevators, use stairs. Ah, uh, fuel cakes. Desert that delivers. I'm not entirely sure what the purpose of a desert in a spacecraft would be, or why they might be advertising it here, but uh, in all seriousness, this is just another minor detail, but again, they should have expected engineers to be looking through this, so... We see some signs on these piping junctions warning that the contents are combustible and that fumes may be present. 
Upon closer inspection, though, we can see that these pipes are carrying oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide, none of which are combustible in an oxygen and nitrogen atmosphere. I suppose the fumes warning could be valid for carbon dioxide in case that there's a significant gas leak, but otherwise this just doesn't make any sense. A couple of these pipes are routed lower for a short length, which makes a bit of sense I suppose if it's supposed to be for inspection or maintenance. However, the supply water line has a valve that is up higher than this lowered section, which kind of seems to be defeating the purpose, to some extent. We can see on these movie and metal posters that there is a shipwide intranet available on the Ishimura, which makes a lot of sense because the ship is going to be probably far away enough from Earth as to not be able to connect to the internet anymore. And with this many people on board, that makes sense that there would be some sort of network of some kind for similar purposes. On the crew deck, we see that there is a court for playing Z-Ball, a zero gravity version of basketball in some sense. The rules seem simple enough, although it's probably more enjoyable playing with other people. Having the opportunity to play sports in space, uh, while personally not appealing so much to myself, can be beneficial for physiological and psychological reasons. On the one hand, while due to the zero gravity movement system here, physical exercise might not be as strenuous as uh, gravitational basketball, it's still beneficial to be able to be exerting yourself and using your muscles in zero gravity to prevent muscle atrophy, as well as increasing your heart rate to keep the heart muscles strong. Since as previously mentioned, the heart doesn't need to work as hard in zero gravity to pump blood, so it also atrophies in the absence of exercise. On top of physiological benefits, sports could offer an escape from the everyday industrial environment that uh, crew members would otherwise be subjected to, as well as an opportunity to interact with friends and co-workers in a non-professional manner, which would be especially valuable in an isolated and confined environment such as a deep space vessel. Perhaps it's just some kind of psychosis, but we can also hear in the background of this game that it appears that the computer is using speech synthesis for having the crowd cheering on Isaac as he's playing. However, for a room that is going to be involving physical activity and fast motions and potentially spontaneous movements into the walls, it's probably better to have more padding over the outer surface of the room, just in case anybody accidentally hits the walls too hard. There's an observation deck for watching the Z-Ball games, but the only way up there seems to be a cargo lift, which is an odd floor plan choice, and also could be potentially hazardous in the event of an emergency. I know I haven't shown any gameplay of it here, but the force gun is much, much more powerful than this as we see it used in this game otherwise. Real great job negotiating, Isaac. While it may not always be the most pleasant view, at least there is an observation room in the crew deck to allow some brief relief from the harsh industrial aesthetic. We see another example of this inaccurate lack of gas diffusion through an open door here. In this storage room on the crew deck, we see what appears to be a waste collection and storage system, which it does make sense that there should be one of these systems somewhere on the ship, but it's a little odd that it's just in a random storage room on the crew deck instead of a dedicated location for disposal or recycling of waste. It's nice to see that at least in the deluxe quarters there's a selection of reading materials available, and the fact that these are on paper means that they're less susceptible to damage from radiation in space compared to electronic systems. Considering how much walkable space there is on this deck that's not being utilized for anything else, it seems like these sleeping quarters could be expanded a little bit so they're not so claustrophobic. The executive shuttle found on the crew deck shares some design similarities with the Kellyon from the beginning of the game. It appears to have a main deck on the upper level and a cargo storage area on the lower level, with another rather large window in the front. The docking system appears to be intended to allow the entire ship to hang off of the docking points on the top, which seems a little odd as this is a relatively small contact point to engage docking. The engine nozzle is once again not smooth, so we can assume for now that this is a fusion-based engine that uses a magnetic nozzle. Based on the design of this docking bay, we can also assume that the fuel is loaded through a port in the lower part of the ship. On the bridge, we see a number of handholds for securing yourself in bumpy conditions or zero gravity, which is nice. Although, as with the Kellyon, there are a fair number of protruding objects that you could bump your head on. 
There also does not appear to be any sort of seat belts or restraints on these seats. The passenger seats also do not have any sort of restraints. We can also see that all of the interfaces appear to be purely holographic. As previously mentioned, having some sort of tactile feedback or physical resistance would allow switches and buttons to be less susceptible to accidental activation, as well as providing some feedback to indicate that the button has been pressed or the switch has been flipped. The placement of the singularity core is a bit odd considering that this is a primary propulsion element or power source for the ship. On the one hand, it's nice that it is easily accessible for repairs, but it's strange that for such an essential element that it doesn't require a more involved integration. Also, based on the computer voiceover, it appears that the Singularity Core is required to operate the sublight engines as well as the Alcubierre warp drive or shock point drive system as well. Which is curious if we were going into the assumption that the sublight engines are fusion based, which would not necessarily require any sort of singularity to operate. There's a number of possible explanations for this though, it could just be making sure that all ship systems are ready to go, or that this is a booster for some sort of fusion operation. It could be really anything. While it might be convenient for us here, there should really be more safety measures in place to prevent the engine from being fired over a walkable area, or at least some sort of barricades when engine testing is underway. In this cargo hold, we can see several cargo containers suspended over a transportation track. This track is located right next to a walkway, and if these cargo containers were to become dislodged, they could easily impact somebody who is within one of these walkways. It's nice to see another rare safety poster and safety tips reminder. However, this is in a just a corner of the cargo bay and not really in a high traffic area where it would be more useful. We can see here an optimal docking and landing procedure for a shuttle in the Ishimura docking bay, in which retro thrusters are used to slow the ship down to a slow enough speed for the docking system to grab the ship from below. This docking system appears to be using devices similar to the gravity tethers we encountered earlier to catch the ship as it's flying in and hold it in place along the dock. Theoretically, this would require less precision from the operator of the ship and make docking easier, at least in theory. The railings on this balcony retract upon disabling gravity and are redeployed when gravity is reactivated. While this makes sense in keeping the platform accessible when operating in zero gravity, it is another failure point and if the railings aren't able to be redeployed when gravity is reactivated, then there could be a problem. To transport cargo through the loading bay, the Ishimura uses a transportation track system similar to what we saw in the cargo bay. While we're still operating in zero G, that doesn't mean we're operating with zero mass, and large heavy objects will still have inertia, making them hard to move using applied force. By using a cargo track system, moving of cargo containers is accomplished more easily than just simply pushing them in zero gravity. That being said, it's a little weird that we have to turn the gravity back on in order to load the cargo into the ship. The safeties are still on. I need to restore gravity before we can load it. Hurry! Not sure if this counts as a plot hole, but it's at least convenient that the remote docking procedures are functioning now, unlike how they were at the beginning of the game. Prepping remote docking procedures. Damn it, Isaac! You don't know what you're doing! Another potential minor inconsistency is that the Singularity Core is no longer in the panel where we installed it in the previous chapter. I suppose we could excuse this as an anxiety-induced hallucination by Isaac, like a nightmare where you forget if you actually did something important. Going back to my nitpicking about the use of the word fire hydrant, we can see here that the words threshold and pilot are displayed on these control panels. Again, this might just be a simple typo and it's not really a huge deal, but in these critical systems where you need to know what everything is doing and how everything functions, if these are supposed to be something other than threshold and pilot, then there could be potential for miscommunication. On the planetary surface, we see the ultimate application of the unified field theory which are these gravity tethers used to extract a chunk of the planet and bring it up into orbit for collection and extraction operations. It's not immediately clear if this is the same chunk that is being held onto by the Ishimura up in orbit, 
but we could suppose that this chunk needs to be held up by both the planetary tethers and the pull from the Ishimura up in orbit. Similar to what we saw in the Ishimura cargo bay, we see a, another cargo track system being used to transport large or heavy cargo around the planetary base. Considering that we're now in a gravity environment, this makes perfect sense, although it is a bit limiting in that it can only transport cargo to specific locations. So if there are any areas that need to have cargo delivered to them that are not on the track system, some other solution will be required. It's tough to judge the exact scale of this excavation site based on visuals alone, but we can see that the ground support infrastructure is pretty extensive, and thus likely pretty expensive. This is why it makes sense that the planets to be cracked have to be selected carefully, since this is a major investment to be developing a planetary settlement for the purposes of dismantling the said planet. Not only does the planet need to be conducive to supporting human life, but it also has to be rich enough in valuable ores that it can pay for itself and make a profit. There's definitely a lot of space economics to consider here, but that's a little bit out of my area of expertise. This dual shutter airlocks door system makes sense for exterior access for this cargo track. If there was to be inclement weather, that could be damaging to cargo. But it is a little odd that they are repeated along the cargo track throughout the interior of this building. One potential application for this could be in the event that there is a failure in the walls or atmospheric containment system, such that a failure in the structural integrity or containment of one part of the building would not affect other areas. Now entering tether control. Cross -contamination field engaged. There's a decontamination room that must be employed before accessing the gravity tether control room. This is a little bit odd since we haven't had to worry about these decontamination rooms before accessing previous gravity systems, except for the centrifuge on the Ishimura. In this setting, if the problem is that the gravity centrifuge systems include electromagnetically sensitive components, which could be damaged by dust or other perhaps magnetic particles, uh, it makes a bit more sense in the planetary surface to have this decontamination, since you'd be more likely to have dust particles on your person when accessing this room than you would be in space. The emergency elevator in the gravity tether control room is apparently the only way in and out of this room, which is an obvious safety concern, and there should at least be some stairs somewhere. Although, as we'll see, if the gravity tethers are operational, there is at least one other way out of the room. Upon accessing the gravity tether room, we can see that the power to the tether has been interrupted and it is not currently operational. I think this is just a poorly worded announcement section here as powering up generators by giving them another electricity source is a little bit confusing, but I'm assuming that they mean that there are gravitational field generators that need to be repowered in order for the primary tether to be activated. It's a little tricky to theorize about how these gravity tethers are actually operating, but if we assume that they are operating using gravitational fields in a similar manner to electromagnetic fields, then we could say that these tethers are producing their own gravitational field, which is localized in their vicinity. And as such, we could assume that the local magnitude is greater than the magnitude of the gravity produced by the planet. Essentially, the gravity tethers are producing in their own gravity that is strong enough to counteract the gravity of the planet and allowing us to fly around. There are no guardrails on this apparently walkable surface in which these cooling fans are mounted. Also, going back to the previous point about the elevator, if this is supposed to be an actual escape route from this room, then there should be ways to fly up through this section without having to pass through the spinning fan blades. Otherwise, you're just asking for trouble. Another clever attention to detail here is actually the presence of these fans. As previously mentioned, in the absence of gravity, there's no buoyant force that's being applied to gases as they heat up, and so there's reduced convective heat transfer to that gas. As a result, we have reduced cooling capabilities in zero gravity in the absence of airflow. So these fans are present to allow air to continually flow past the gravity tether and allow convective cooling to continue. This elevator here would be a great shortcut if there was only some way to call the elevator down to the ground floor. Oh well, too bad nobody thought of that. And finally, let us assume for a moment that Aegis 7 is approximately the size and density of Earth, since people have been walking around on its surface without too much difficulty. So we can say the gravity is about the same. 
With that in mind, when Isaac takes off from the planetary surface in the shuttle, he reaches orbit in approximately five seconds. Let's assume that this is approximately the equivalent of low Earth orbit, which is the altitude at which the International Space Station orbits. That is the equivalent of traveling 260 miles in about five seconds, which translates to over 180,000 miles per hour, or a little more than the escape velocity of Jupiter. This part I think though is forgivable, considering that at the beginning of the flight, the marker is directly in front of Isaac, emitting brain-altering radiation and messing with his perception. So we can assume that it actually took longer than five seconds. It's just shown like that for the purposes of the game, and having it complete in a reasonable amount of time. And with that, we have survived reviewing Dead Space in exhaustive and pedantic detail. Hopefully now I've communicated just why I enjoy this series so much, especially in this remake, which aside from excessive safety hazards, includes a lot of attention to detail and a good presentation of the engineering aspect of the setting. Especially in this note, I appreciate that they don't use excessive techno babble or random mechanical boxes to accomplish things. There are actually somewhat reasonable or realistic technological systems in place here, according to our rule of one miracle exception at least. Also, from a writing perspective, it's nice to see that the characters aren't making stupid decisions like typical in horror movies, and that they are actually reacting in a way that a reasonable person might. Sure, the alien zombies might be a bit unrealistic, but the setting of the game and the progression of the story reflect the combination of rapid problem solving, critical thinking, and technical knowledge that would be required to respond to an emergency situation that might occur during a space mission. And for the most part, the characters do respond in this way. They don't just get out of a sticky situation from a deus ex machina, they actually work through and find ways to solve the problem. And this is another big part of why I enjoy this series, is that throughout the game, Isaac is put into many worst case scenarios that are just terrible and everything's going wrong, and there's every reason to just give up and quit. But what does he do? He tries to solve the problem. He finds another way out or another thing that we can try to resolve the situation, to fix the problem, keeps looking for alternative solutions. Keeps trying to find a way to solve the problem. You really need me to tell you this is a bad idea. Well, I'm all out of good ideas, so guess what's left? And when you boil it down, desalinate it, invent off the extra gas, that's really what engineering is all about, is solving problems. And that's the biggest reason why this is one of my favorite space games. And with all that said, Thank you very much for watching. I very much appreciate you spending the time to go through this video and hopefully it was interesting and informative for you. I would gladly welcome any corrections or any comments you might have because it's certainly possible that I made some mistakes here too. I do have a couple more of these projects that I would like to do sometime, but they are gonna take quite a while to finish. So if you enjoyed this, feel free to leave a like and or a comment letting me know that. And if you'd like to be notified the next time I have some sort of project to showcase, including the next one of these reviews, feel free to subscribe. But this video has been going on long enough, so just want to say thank you again for watching, and I hope you have a great day.